The dust has settled since UFC 303, and it's time for us to discuss the narrative shift for every single fighter coming out of this card. Now, when I say the narrative shift, I'm talking about the narrative from the MMA fan base in general. This is not just my narrative, but this is the narrative of the MMA fan base, or at least the way I perceive it. Do I agree with every single narrative? Not really. Some of them I'll critique, some of them I do agree with, and not every single fighter has a narrative coming out of it, and that's actually usually a problem. If everyone's lukewarm about you, and nothing has changed about you since you performed on this card, that's a problem, okay? Now, again, I do this after every single big UFC card, I'll be doing a little bit of a, you know, take on what fight should be next for each of these guys too. But without further ado, let's get into this. I'm in a different setting. I'm sorry if the sound doesn't sound so good. Um, I am away for the July 4th week, but we're still going to be doing some content. And once I get back, we'll be full steam ahead. Either way, let's get into this early prelims. Uh, Ricky Simone versus Vinicius Oliveira. Narrative shift for Vinicius Oliveira. Hyped up by the hardcore fans, like the real hardcore fans. Hadn't really proven himself. I didn't think he was that great, especially because he had a really razor close fight before he got his flying knee KO in his UFC debut. And the guy that he had a close fight with, Sopage, was not that good. And I thought he was going to lose. He beat Ricky Simone, kind of styled on him. And he's got one of the most entertaining styles in the game. He's similar to Peyton Talbot, and I'll discuss Peyton Talbot in a little bit. But what I like about his style is that he commits to every single strike he throws and he has a very offensive first approach he is willing to put his chin and his um you know he's willing to take risks he's willing to put his chin on the firing line and again he sits down on his shots he really commits to everything there's no hesitancy and it just creates for a very high paced aggressive fight that has a high chance of us getting a finish and um, I was really impressed with the way that he was fighting. And I think this guy's going to be a fan favorite. Uh, really good win. I mean, Ricky Simone was a highly rated guy going into this. But the thing is, it's like every single fight Ricky Simone goes into these days, he's a highly rated guy. This guy used to be ranked. This used to be like the respected heavy pressure wrestler, the dark horse wrestler of the bantamweight division. He just got beat by Vinicius Oliveira. Mario Batista, who we all thought Ricky Simone was about to out-wrestle and out-grapple. And it's like, bro, I'm starting to think of it like this, but Ricky Simone's only great performance in his UFC career was against Jack Shore. And that was it. And Jack Shore, um, I don't know, he seemed to have a little bit of trouble cutting weight, which is a little bit weird because he moved up a weight class and he looks like a bag of milk. But either way, Ricky Simone, I think the narrative coming out of this is he's always been a little bit overrated. Uh, the wrestling game that he has has been overhyped and overrated. His wrestling just isn't all that, okay? Not only with his output when it comes to takedowns, but his ability to keep people down ain't all that. You know, people used to talk about Ricky Simone as being this, like, heavy pressure wrestler that just put the pace on you like nobody else. I've never seen him do that. He's got a big blast double leg. He can get you down. He's super strong. He's explosive. But, like, he's just not that effective with it. And also just kind of let the fight get away from him you know what I mean a lack of output as well so Ricky Simone kind of getting fraud checked left and right these days so I feel like that's not a good thing for him he really needs a win in his next fight otherwise he's on the verge of getting cut if he loses three in a row this guy used to be one of the better fighters in the division I'm sure he could beat the worst that the bantamweight division has to offer I know he's getting tough matchups but still Vinicius Oliveira was a huge step down in competition and Mario Batista was a step down in competition from Song Yudong. So, Ricky Simone, I don't know if he's that good, to be honest. I mean, he's he's good, but he's been overrated. Let's get on to the next one. Ray Suruya versus Carlos Hernandez. Ray Suruya is basically the junior version of Tatsudo Taida. Heavy grappling style. And he's like one of these guys that sort of sticks to you on the ground. You know what I mean? He's one of these sticky grapplers. I don't know what they're cooking up there in Japan, but man, they're producing some excellent grapplers and entertaining ones at that. Uh, Carlos Hernandez, narrative coming out of this is actually his grappling isn't so bad after all. Um, yes, he got out grappled, okay? Like Ray Suruya did out grapple him. But Carlos Hernandez showcased grit and hustle in that third round and was able to actually get some control over Ray Suruya in the grappling. 
And Ray Suduya, I really do respect this guy's skill set. So for Carlos Hernandez to lose the first two and get the upper hand in the third in that place um, where we don't think of him as that good, that is actually a good look for him. So, you know, Ray Suduya, only 22 or 23 years old with this level of grappling. I mean, this is going to be a problem in the flyweight division. A lot of new flyweight prospects. He's someone to watch for. That's kind of the narrative shift. I guess he's legit. You know, he, he won the road to the UFC. And this tells us that he is legit, especially for his age. Uh, and Carlos Hernandez, not a pipsqueak on the ground anymore in our minds. Not a total pipsqueak on the ground. Next up, Martin Budai and Andre Orlovsky. Now, this is my favorite narrative shift. Andre Orlovsky's leaving the UFC. He was a little bit upset because he, you know, arguably got shafted in this one. Arguably got robbed. And I believe he won this fight too, but it was one of those stinkers, boring ass fights that who really gives a fuck about at the end of the day. So we're not going to sit here and cry about the robbery. It was that bad. Andre Orlovsky did what he normally does, right? Martin Budai though. The narrative shift is no longer is Martin Budai going to earn his freedom. It's Martin Budai is locked into the apex for the next few years. Unfortunately, when you have the option to earn your freedom and that's the way it works, he had a four fight win streak, fought Shamil Blob Gaziev. They give you another chance. They gave him a crafty vet in Arlovsky. The way you earn your freedom by beating Arlovsky or by fighting Arlovsky is either by getting KO'd, trying to knock him out, which just means like you're saying, fuck it, dude. This guy's pillow hands. I'm going to fucking knock this guy out. I'm tired of this, this little tit-tat game that we're playing. This little knee to the thigh game that we're playing. You can literally earn your freedom by getting KO'd. Martin Budai was too scared to really go after this. I don't know if he was scared, but, you know, just an unmotivated, tired-ass approach to this fight. Dude, you're an NPC. I'm sorry. This guy's 45 years old, and you're doing an inside thigh clinch striking game? What the fuck are you doing, man? This is getting out of hand. The jet was rolling up. The jet was freaking ramping up. They had it outside waiting for you, and then t fucking hell, man. What the heck? I mean, come on, man. I'm just tired of seeing these heavyweights play this little pit pat clinch game with Andre Orlovsky. He's not dangerous. He's got pillow hands. He's showing up for show money at this point. Okay. And Martin Budai doesn't go after it. Doesn't look for a finish. Show no respect for Andre Orlovsky. The narrative shift is, I'm sorry, you're a fucking heavyweight NPC that's going to receive a battery pack and you're only fighting in the apex. And I want the UFC to get rid of the apex. So they may get rid of Martin Budai if they do that. He's locked in there for the next few years until he can actually showcase a little bit of heart. I don't understand. I mean, this guy's a pro athlete, professional UFC fighter, and that's his game? Like, don't you want to get a KO? Don't, don't you want to, like, I don't know, damage someone in a fight? You train for this. What are you doing? I'd love to see these heavyweights train. Are, are these guys just chilling in the clinch, kneeing each other to the thigh up against their the wall in practice? I don't get it. Why is that a style that all these NPC heavyweights have? It really is the worst style to watch in the sport. I do like low-level heavyweight striking matches, but not this. Not this, man. Like, again, you want to get some respect? Go after it. Make it an ugly fight. Swing for the fucking fences. So what if you gas out? So what if you gas out so hard, you know, because, you, you know, you're out of shape because you should be fighting at welterweight. Because look at Martin Budai, he's literally a welterweight. <laughs> he's more hes more like an 85er. He's like a tall 85er fighting at heavyweight. Fair enough. You gas out, you get finished by the 45-year-old Andre Olofsky. At least you tried. We'll respect that. And guess what? There's a great chance that you finish him. <sighs> Michelle Watterson versus Jillian Roberson. Michelle Watterson, she's the high uh, Toyota tires. You know, UFC, UFC, they're working with a brand and the brand needs someone to do a commercial for them. They're calling up Michelle Watterson to do one of her high yaw kicks. All right. That's basically what Michelle Watterson's been able to do. And Jillian Roberson, an example of a fun WMMA fighter. She is one of these people that if she's on a card, we can always count on her to not give us the usual shadow box at range, clinch up against the fence. She actually goes for finishes. You know what I mean? And she actually imposes her will. And I respect it. So Jillian Roberson, if you see her on a card in the future, you don't have to get so pissed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's get on to the next one. Uh, Peyton Talbot, the real Sean O'Malley versus Giannis Gamori. Giannis Gamori, just a, a bit of an NPC. 
in the world or game of Peyton Talbot. We didn't really learn much about Peyton Talbot, to be honest. Like, we just know that he has a lot of power. Very similar to Vinicius Oliveira. And this is what makes an entertaining striker. If you're willing to accept punishment and you're committing and sitting down on every single strike and composure is a big part of it too. All of those things together creates the most entertaining style of striker. Now, I want to see him fight one of the Basharat bros. Javid Basharat, who's someone that's, you know, getting a lot of hype these days. And hardcore fans are going to pick him no matter who he fights. Dude, Basharat, man. He's the, you obviously go Basharat. Tune into any prediction video and you'll hear people say, well, obviously going to go Basharat. You know, they're so fucking sold on this guy. Uh, his brother got fraud checked earlier this year. Eamon Zahabi beat the other Basharat. I think Peyton Talbot knocks the the real Basharat, the big brother Basharat out. I think that would be a really good win for him to have because it kind of proves that he can get rid of a grappler that is respected by hardcore fans. Because people are saying, oh, who cares if he knocks out a can? First off, you knock out a can, isn't that what you're supposed to do? You know what I mean? Isn't that the best thing you can do? So I don't understand why there's so much pushback. He's doing exactly what he should be doing with these opponents. And he's got a lot of power. You put him in front of Garbrandt, he's probably knocking his ass out too. Do we still know if this guy's going to be a champ? No, but he has plot armor. And it seems like that plot armor is working. All right. It seems like if there was ever any doubt about this guy getting to the rankings or winning his next few fights after this, I don't think there's any doubt anymore. It might not be until he fights someone in the top five that he loses. And he might not even lose with the way things are going, with the way things went for O'Malley. This is the real O'Malley, let's not forget. Let's get on to the next one. Charles Jordan versus Gene Silva. Charles Jordan kind of getting exposed as a bit of a pillow puncher these days. I mean, Gene Silva, there was a little bit of a doubt as to whether or not he'd be able to beat Charles Jordan, who is a respected outside of the rankings featherweight fighter with tons of output. Um, and he can light people up at a distance. You know what I mean? He's way better than Weston Wilson, like 100 times better than Weston Wilson. Whenever you see someone come into the UFC and they dog walk their first opponent and their first opponent is a meme, of course you're going to doubt their ability to do that to someone that's actually decent. Uh, did he do that to someone that was like Charles Jordan? Not exactly that, but he still walked him down, gave him no respect whatsoever, and knocked his ass out. Charles Jordan has a good chin, so... What does that mean for Gene Silva? I mean, it means he's got a shitload of power. It means that he fought, you know, like a bit of an autist in his first fight. Well, he's always going to give us that fight style, okay? He's always going to fight that way if he's fighting that way in front of Charles Jordan. The first couple of good shots he landed on him, he started dancing. He started emoting. So we can trust in Gene Silva to bring us an entertaining fight against everyone because he didn't look jittery at all given the step up in competition. He's legit. Like, he is legit. He can knock people out that are solid strikers in the featherweight division. And so this isn't just going to be like a can beater. He's someone that is capable of working his way up to the ranking someday. Whereas before, we didn't know. Now we know. Charles Jordan, pillow puncher, can't hurt people. And if you have power, you just don't have to respect what's coming back in your direction. But you kind of have to have that you know, screw loose to be able to just actually make it happen and actually walk him down and sit on the shots and not care about getting hit. So Gene Silva has that ability. Not everyone's going to have that ability just because they have power. Let's get on to the next one. Cub Swanson, Andre Feely, no narrative shift at all. There's no narrative shift on Andre Feely. Very close fight with Cub Swanson. Could have arguably went to Cub Swanson. And that's kind of the thing with Andre Feely. It's like, He's having close fights with 41-year-olds like Cub Swanson that are known for showing up. He's always game. But Feely's just, you know, he's never, ever going to be decent in the rankings. No narrative shift. Cub Swanson, no narrative shift. Just the same old guy. It was a good fight. It was actually a great fight. It got fight of the night. There's literally no narrative shift whatsoever. Uh, Joe Pfeiffer, Joe Sodium Pfeiffer versus Mark andre Barriou. Mark andre Barriou, no narrative shift. Just can't withstand the power of Joe Pfeiffer. Joe Pfeiffer... We were starting to doubt his power a little bit. You know what I mean? Because he broke that Ngannou punch record. And people call him the strongest man in the UFC. And listen, Joe Pfeiffer, we know the guy's mentality. We know how Pfeiffer is. And we know he's got enough grit and enough salt to fill a salt mine. But again, the power wasn't necessarily translating. Like he hit Jack Hermanson in the first couple of rounds a couple of times. And Jack didn't go down. 
He hit Abdul Razak al Hassan clean through the guard a couple of times on the chin, didn't go down. And I was starting to think, man, maybe it's just a bunch of thud that everyone's talking about. Maybe maybe the the punch machine's just getting hit with more thud than it's ever gotten hit with, and it's rattling around. But, man, I don't know if he's got that power that can put people to sleep. <laughs> he's got that power to put people to sleep, Joe Pfeiffer. Seriously. Again, there, there's always this thing of, you know, he's a heavy hitter. And it's like, dude, they never knock anyone out, though. I know he broke the fucking record, but he actually got the KO. Looked like it was going to be one of those thud KOs, but he made sure to land that nasty uppercut at the end of it and just forced his way through it, to be honest, which was awesome. He gave Mark andre Barryu zero respect. Zero respect. And you love to see it because Mark andre Barryu is a decision guy. He's not really got a lot of power. He's going to march forward. Like, come on. You, you can't be wasting time fucking leg kicking on the outside against this guy if you're Joe Pfeiffer and you just took a big loss against Jack Hermanson. You got to make a statement. And he did exactly that. So Joe Pfeiffer, we know he's going to destroy people outside of the rankings. He should not be fighting these guys. And also, we don't want to see him fight Paul Craig. I know he's got some beef with Paul Craig. I want to see him fight like Michelle Podetta or something like that. That would be an absolute banger. All right, you could make that a whole main event. Let's get on to the next one. Ian Gary versus Michael Page. Michael Page, the narrative shift here is he might actually be the best striker at 170. All right, now I know Wonderboy exists and I know Wonderboy's done more, but right now, okay, Wonderboy's getting older and I know he's one of these old guys that doesn't really age like everyone else. He's still pretty good, still very fast, and no one can outpoint him. But people have moments against Wonderboy. Like, I've not seen anyone have moments against Michael Page. It is kind of true that Kevin Holland did better than Ian Gary. And this is sort of the thing about Ian Gary is I don't look at Ian Gary striking the same. And he said in his post-fight interview, he said something to the effect of, I didn't even need to grapple, but I did it anyway. It's like you absolutely needed to. You were getting fucked up on the feet in the second round. You were getting toasted on the feet in the beginning of the third before the grappling exchanges. I mean, he had nothing for Michael Page. And Michael Page's speed, like, everyone knows what he's going to do. And he's just too fast for you to stop it. So, as I said, um, maybe we could do an Anthony Smith matchup. <laughs> that would be interesting. Uh, but, yeah, Michael Page, ridiculous striking. No one can hang with this guy on the feet. Not even a guy like uh, Jack De La Maddalena. I don't think anyone hangs with him. And so, I thought Gary was going to be able to go tit for tat because he's fast too and he's got a long rangey striking style so he looked really unconfident on the feet gary i guess you know the way that he was looking against jeff neal it was a slow fight but you could have made the argument that well you got to respect the power of jeff neal if that guy gets a combination off on you you're probably going to get knocked out and michael page does one thing he just blitzes forward with the overhand i think ian gary could just like maybe outpoint him Maybe he'll do better, but no. Uh, that's the second underwhelming striking performance from Ian Gary. I don't think his striking is going to be that dominant at the highest level. You know what I mean? His grappling was good, though. So there we go. That's that's what we're going to talk about for Ian Gary. His grappling looked phenomenal. And now we know that he can pull out the grappling and win fights with it, right? I know we got a couple of submissions in Cage Warriors, but... He can win fights at the highest level with his grappling. It's not just that he took down Michael Page like Kevin Holland did. He took his back twice, almost submitted him in the first round. We were that close to having a, holy shit, this guy could actually be champion moment. And you know what? I still think he has championship potential. Um, but looked very skittish on the feet. He looked a little bit slow out there, to be honest. Maybe it's just in comparison to Michael Page. And again, I think that Michael Page might actually be the best 170-pound striker. Two fights into the UFC, I think it's time that we start to talk about him like that. But Ian Gary, again, I, I thought that maybe Ian Gary had potential to be the best striker in this division. But no, um, not after getting done like that against Michael Page. Got embarrassed on the feet, really. But I think it, it just is Michael Page is that difficult. Some people are talking about Ian Gary as he gets destroyed by anyone above Michael Page, right? Because Page is lower in the rankings, and that's how they think, well, you know, he got pieced up by someone lower in the rankings. Imagine what Usman would do to him on the feet. Like, it's a totally different fucking matchup, right? Or Shavkat eats him alive. I kind of do think Shavkat beats him. Like, I don't think Ian Gary's going to be able to submit Shavkat or 
easily outstrike him but Shavkat is very hittable and he sort of oafs forward on the feet I know he's a welterweight and he's very skilled but he's not that hard of a problem to solve or I should say he's not that difficult to hit like he just marches people down he kind of waltzes into range bob and weave bob and weave and sort of like Habib but with less fervor and less speed Shavkat Rachmanov again he just kind of zombies in there better than Ortega but still kind of zombies in there I could very well see Ian Gary having an ability to keep him on the outside. You know what I mean? I don't think he just gets destroyed by Shavkat. Again, that seems to be the narrative for the majority of fans. It's like, Gary sucks on the feet. Like, no, he doesn't. I really do believe that he has an opportunity to outstrike anyone else. Maybe not Wonderboy. I don't think he outstrikes Wonderboy, but anyone else, I think he can outstrike. Um, but the thing is, and also... Chin, we got to talk about Ian Gary's ability to take a punch because a lot of us were saying, including myself, he doesn't look like he has a head capable of taking a punch. He's got a little bit of a pea head, and he's on the pea protein instead of the whey protein. Ian Gary's a vegan, but he's taken some big punches from Michael Page. He's taken some big punches from Jeff Neal. Not been KO'd yet. I mean, he got hurt against Song Kanan, but not against these better and more dangerous strikers, so he could take a punch. I don't think we should continue to say things like, if Gary gets hit by Michael Page, I could see him getting sparked out. He's a little bit chinny. I think that conversation has to die. I still really think Ian Gary has a chance to become a champion because, again, he showcased an ability to fight, have fight IQ and actually shoot takedowns on a guy that was getting the better of him on the feet. And he shot a takedown before Michael Page even started to get the better of him on the feet, to be honest. So that just goes to show that he didn't even shoot takedowns or look to grapple because the striking exchanges weren't playing out so well for him. I mean, maybe he did that in the third round, but I'm talking early on. Instead of playing into his ego because he's the striker and I want to prove a point, I'm going to outstrike Michael Page. He just went after the takedown, went after the submission. Boring fight, though. Totally embarrassed on the feet, to be honest. But again, I think that's Michael Page. I think that's MVP. I just think he's that good. That's the narrative shift with him. The next time he fights, I'm going to say if it's on the feet, he's going to win every single second. All right, so whoever he fights next, if it's a striker, I'm choosing him. And you kind of have to choose him. Even if it's Wonderboy Thompson, you have to choose him. So he's totally killed off this whole narrative of him just being a Bellator can beater. On to the next one, Anthony Smith versus Roman Delidze. The narrative shift here is Roman Delidze can succeed at light heavyweight. And the thing is, I know we clown Anthony Smith because he's not that good at light heavyweight, but he's been a top 15 guy. For his whole career at light heavyweight. If Roman Delidze can beat Anthony Smith. And Anthony Smith can beat people like Vitor Petrino. And Anthony Smith can beat people like. What's his name? Ryan Spann multiple times. Right? Then he can be a staple in the top 15. At middleweight. It honestly seems like he fluked his way into the top 15. Over Jack Hermanson. Not really a fluke. Hermanson was shooting takedowns like a bit of a fool. But then again Hermanson didn't know how legit Roman Delidze really was. I think Hermanson beats him in a rematch. But my point is, I, I think that this is the division for Roman. I think he should fight at light heavyweight. His days of middleweight, they should be done. Because it's a more stacked division. It's more competitive. There's a million hyped up prospects with more hype than him. And the UFC is going to be trying to get them up the ranks before Roman Delidze. Move up to light heavyweight. You just beat Anthony Smith. That's a pretty big name. And there's like five guys, six or seven max, that are actually that good at light heavyweight. And Roman Delidze could just outgrapple one of them and get himself close to a title shot eventually. So that's the move for him. And again, the, the divisional skill gap proved yet again. I mean, we see this all the time, but the least respected ranked middleweight striker. One of the least respected strikers in the middleweight division. And I'm talking about the narrative. Like, if there's anyone that gets clowned the most for his striking these days, especially amongst the hardcore fans, it's Roman. We call Marvin Vittori mid. We use Roman Delidze striking as an example as being the worst at middleweight because he lost to Marvin Vittori. And he went out there and just kind of outskilled and shut down Anthony Smith easily on the feet, like with good output too. And Smith was slow as a slug. Like this was honestly the worst he's ever looked. And he had like three weeks for this fight. I know this was sort of short notice, but he found out about this a week before Ortega and Diego Lopez had their fight booked, and that was two weeks out. So Anthony Smith had a good old month, basically. <laughs> and he was saying that he was in shape. He looked better off the couch 
with no training against Khalil Roundtree. That's actually insane. Like, against Khalil Roundtree, he said that he did no training from the moment he won against Ryan Spann in, in um, I think it was August, on the Holloway TKZ card. And that fight, no training, he wasn't in the gym at all. Took it on, like, a couple days' notice. And he looked way better. Maybe that just goes to show that this is, like, the, the quickest fall-off of, of physicality we've ever seen. I know Anthony Smith has been kind of regressing physically in general, but you get what I'm saying, like, Maybe it's Khalil Roundtree not even being that good. Maybe it's just light heavyweight sucking. Maybe that's what it is. I think that could just be what it is as well. It's probably both. I mean, if Khalil Roundtree and Anthony Smith are having a somewhat competitive fight, and it was somewhat competitive, it actually was. I know Khalil was winning, and I know he got the vicious knockout, but Smith was doing a lot better. He looked like he was in slow motion out there. And so what I want to see next is I want to see him fight MVP. I want to see the speed difference between MVP and Anthony Smith. And Anthony Smith, you know, he has a size advantage. And I think he'd be able to go out there and maybe win, out, win the outside foot battle. If not, if he doesn't want to get lean and fight at 170 or 185, meet MVP halfway, then I honestly think he should move up to heavyweight and fight someone like Shamil the Blob Gaziev. At this point, I just don't see why he's going to be welcoming all the the young talent in the light heavyweight division the guys that are fresh that have never been put away that are super durable have fun fights have memeable fights that's what i think anthony smith should do have fun memeable fights on to the next one diego lopez versus dan Ige. um i don't know if there was a big narrative shift for dan Ige other than like he's one of the bmfs of his division you know what i mean and i think that because this was a McGregor card and a lot of casuals were in attendance and a lot of casuals were in the arena that probably didn't know Dan Ige before, he's a much bigger name now. Especially because this is probably like the shortest notice fight anyone's ever taken. Okay, the night of hours before the fight takes place, you're filling in for Brian Ortega. So narrative shift for Dan Ige is he becomes a bit of a fan favorite or just becomes much more well-known, more well-respected, and people are going to be calling him the BMF of that division. And for Diego Lopez, the narrative shift here is not really a narrative shift because people weren't saying that he had great cardio, but I think that he just doesn't have good cardio in general. All right, so now we kind of know that people can break Diego Lopez down a little bit. And to be fair, Dan Ige didn't have to cut weight and was training, was actively getting ready for a fight two weeks from now. So his gas tank was amazing, and maybe that was just the difference between a guy's gas tank that doesn't cut weight and someone's gas tank that does cut weight. But still, Diego Lopez is always in the gym, right? He's always training. He's just become a star recently, so he's still super hungry. He's not, like, taking a lot of time off. He's not going on vacations and whatnot, right? I don't think anyone was really saying he was going to be known for his cardio but he'll never be known for his cardio he'll be known for having mid to bad cardio until he proves this otherwise but that's kind of what we're going to be talking about from now on with Diego Lopez is if he can't finish someone his pace is going to slow down quite a bit and he could get finished in the later rounds you know if you think that someone survives an early Diego Lopez onslaught then you could pick them to finish Diego Lopez in the future in the later rounds now, again, I do think his cardio will be better if he isn't fighting someone that has no weight cut that's also a lot bigger than him. You know, someone like Danny Gay can wear on you, but at the end of the day, um, his cardio is only going to be a little bit better if he has a full training camp. So, yeah, that's kind of what we're going to say about Diego Lopez, but outstruck Danny Gay early and walked Danny Gay down and got in close quarters with Ige. And Ige is amazing in close quarters, that's where he's most dangerous. And even with a weight cut, Diego Lopez took the biggest punches Dan Ige had to offer, and he didn't get dropped once. So he's super durable, right? Diego Lopez's power, I know he didn't knock Ige out, but I, again, Ige's chin was a lot better than it normally would be because he didn't have to cut weight. You know what I mean? And he was still in pretty good shape. So I still think Diego Lopez is really powerful, but just the fact that he was able to march down a guy like Dan Ige, outstrike him in close quarters... Just goes to show how well-rounded he is. And of course, we saw him dominate the ground game in this fight as well. I think Diego Lopez showed a good version of himself, but his cardio, not very good. Main event. 
Uh, people are talking about Yuri Braska possibly moving to middleweight. Fuck no. All right? Hell no. I don't want to see Yuri Braska move to middleweight. He relies on his chin. He relies on his toughness. He should stop relying on it so much, but even if he gets better defense, that still is a big part of Yuri's style. Like, you, sh you can't change everything that got you to the dance. You can't change everything that made you a champion. Yuri still has to be aggressive in his fights. He still has to be willing to get hit. And just because you get KO'd by Alex Pereira does not mean that you're just going to get KO'd by the other guys at light heavyweight. It means that you should definitely improve your defense and not rely on your chin as much. But again, my point is, for a guy like Yuri that relies on being tough, you don't want him to cut weight. He doesn't have much of a weight cut at light heavyweight, which is impressive because he looks like a massive guy at light heavyweight. Um, always lean. He's not one of these guys that blows up in the offseason and puts on like 20, 30 pounds or whatever. But Yuri Braska would introduce a difficult weight cut if you were to go down a middleweight. And I just don't want him to start weight cutting. And there are divisional skill gaps. Yes, Yuri Prohaska is a wild man, and he could be able to go out there and, you know, break down a guy like Sean Strickland, who's got amazing defense, just by throwing the kitchen sink at him. But he could also just not be on these guys' level and not be able to hit them as often because they're just better. Look at what Roman Delidzi did to Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith was competitive with Khalil Roundtree, and Roman Delidzi schooled him on the feet, right? I don't want him to move to middleweight. It's a more difficult weight class, better guys. A weight cut is not going to be great. I know that he's fighting heavy punchers, but, you know, he's taking punches with not a bad weight cut. And he's taking punches from Alex Pereira. So I think he should stay in this division. He will never fight Alex again. Unfortunate, but he's never going to get the jump on him. That's just someone that has his number, but it might be the only guy that has his number in this weight class. I think Yuri is still capable of beating everyone else, especially because... I mean, you're going to have to strike with him. I mean, Magomed could take him down, but Magomed can't hold down anyone. He can't hold down people worth shit. So I think that Yuri should stay in this weight class, take seven or eight months off, work on the defense, and I think he could become a champion. I don't think that his chin is gone forever just because he got slept once by Alex. He didn't really get TKO'd badly in the first fight, just got dropped once. It wasn't so bad. So stay in this weight class. Do not move down to 185. That would be horrible for him. A deeper division with more skilled fighters when you're cutting a ton of weight. Not a good idea. Alex Pereira, narrative shift on him. Um, if there was any doubt about him being a top 15 fighter of all time, people that were saying pump the brakes, no doubt anymore. You have to consider him top 15 all time. Now there's a conversation about him being top 10. I haven't really thought about it so much, uh, namely where exactly he should be in the top 10. But there is a conversation to be had. People are bringing up Habib, of course. Habib's always the guy that they bring up whenever someone is starting to be talked about as a goat. It's like Habib's the first guy that they bring up. Kind of ironic, by the way, because Habib is the guy that people always say is the most overrated fighter ever. He's not a goat. Then why do people always bring him up first when it comes to this guy's achieving goat status? He, he's better than Habib now. Uh, why is Habib always the one? I know it's because Habib fans can be delusional and they'll call Habib the go to the sport, but I actually hear more people saying that Habib's overrated these days. So maybe you shouldn't be bringing up Habib to kind of prove that Alex Pereira is becoming goaded if you don't think Habib's that goaded. Maybe just say he's top 10 all time or maybe say, I think he might have passed Usman or whatever. Either way, he's literally on his way to becoming one of the goats in the span of a couple of years. I know Dana White was glazing John Jones. Alex Pereira is 8-1 since he joined the UFC with five title wins and a win over Jan Blachowicz. Five title wins, four title wins, and a win over Jan Blachowicz. Insane. He's like the pound-for-pound pound number two fighter on the planet. We saw this guy get flatlined last year by Adesanya, and a lot of us thought that, you know, Alex Pereira is going to leave the UFC just as quick as he came in. Like, this is it for him. He got brutally knocked out. He's kind of old. He's moving up too quick to fight Jan Blachowicz. We didn't necessarily think it was over, but we thought that, yeah, we didn't think he was going to achieve this level of greatness. Since then, he's won four fights. Insane. And he's been getting better and more dominant with every performance. And again, people are still doubting. I know the MMA guru was talking about how this kind of exposes the sport, and I get it because, you know, 
in other sports, you don't have people just proving points and like fighting with their ego. And a lot of times, for example, I talked about Ian Gary tossed his ego to the wayside and took the path of least resistance. The thing is, though, Yuri Prohaska is not a good grappler. And yeah, maybe he should be better because he has a lot more training, but maybe Alex Pereira is just that much of a phenom and he's fucking built different, this guy. He's built like a brick wall. Alex Pereira is not just your average high-level kickboxer. He's a high-level kickboxer that is a freak of nature with the way that he's built, with the way that he hits. Yuri Prohaska is a predominant striker. You know what I mean? Like this idea that Yuri Prohaska, Jamal Hill, guys that make a living on the feet, like that's what they do. They disrupt people. They knock people out. They highly rate their striking. They take great pride in their striking. They grapple, but they're not investing most of their time and energy into grappling during their sparring sessions. Maybe a lot of takedown defense and whatnot, but listen, light heavyweight's clearly not the most developed division. I mean, we talked about light heavyweight not being that good. Still shits all over heavyweight, and we'll talk about heavyweight in a little bit, but like, who is going to destroy him on the ground? Yuri Prohaska tried in the first fight, couldn't do dog shit to him on the ground. Now, maybe if he tried his hardest and was diving at the legs every single second, maybe he could win a decision. But like, <laughs> Yuri's not a fucking grappler. Either way, Alex Pereira is a freak, dude. That's what people need to understand. This ain't just, he's just, he's so good on the feet. Like, he's also just like built different, literally built different. He's like a brick wall. Okay. You can just trap your hands on the ground and, and just nullify everything that you're doing. I do think Magomed will be able to take him down, but Magomed isn't a finisher on the ground. Magomed ain't that good, and I think that Alex Pereira is probably rapidly improving on the ground, and I think he's confident enough to at least survive to where he fights people right now without a fear in the world, with no fear in the world about getting taken down. No fear in the world about getting taken down, not because he can't get taken down, but because he knows that if he gets taken down, he'll be fine. And that was proven in the Jan Blachowicz fight. That was proven in the Yuri fight. And so I guess what I'm saying now is I think Alex Pereira doesn't have competition in this weight class. I want to see him fight Magomed because that is the stylistic matchup that we need to see. And Magomed will shoot takedowns. And Magomed's also much more defensively sound than Yuri and Hill. Maybe not as fun to watch on the feet, but he's still pretty entertaining and good on the feet, and defensively sound, and he doesn't make that many mistakes. That's a necessary fight for us to see, and he could mix it up well enough to get the win because he's defensively sound. But again, Alex Pereira, when he came up to light heavyweight, he was so patient against Hill. He was very patient against Yuri. He's now hunting people down. He fought Yuri with zero respect. He caught Yuri effortlessly with multiple left hooks in the first round. I was marching him down, jabbing him up, kicking him to the body. You know, he was throwing lots of output because of his confidence. And I think he's going to take a fight to Magomed. And I think he's going to force Magomed to exchange with him. And Pereira's getting better. He's literally improving. You know what I mean? And the confidence on the feet is growing. And I think he KOs Magomed. And I think he badly beats him. He's just another level. And these guys, yeah, you can grapple. I don't think any of these guys finish him. And... They're probably not going to have the Marab Davalashvili gas tank to just shoot 100 takedowns. Maybe someone's going to have to do it, but yeah, I don't think it's going to be done. You know what I mean? So, how will he do at heavyweight? He beats everyone, in my opinion, except for Tom Aspinall, if Aspinall shoots a takedown. If Aspinall shoots a takedown, he can muscle Alex Pereira to the ground, put everything into it, and I think he can submit him because Aspinall is one of these heavyweights that has a great submission game. We saw how quickly he was able to dispose of Volkov. We saw how quickly he was able to dispose of Arlovsky. If anyone at heavyweight stands on the feet with this guy, someone left a comment on my video the other day saying, you think he beats Gon? Gon is just a bigger version than him. I know Gon is just leaner at heavyweight, and he's like not more of a natural lean guy walking around in the 250s, but Alex Pereira is damn near the same size as him with way more power and way more skill. Like, I know Gon is really skilled and he's really elusive and he's high output. He beats up fat fucks, all right? He beats up the biggest cans. Gon has been fighting Sergey Spivak and tied to Ivasa. And someone used the example. 
Tai dropped him and he still beat him. He fought Tai to Ivasa as if the fact that he beat Tai to Ivasa proved that he could beat a power puncher like Alex Pereira. Tied to Ivasa is an absolute bum compared to Alex Pereira. Okay? He's got none of the skill. Cyril Ghosn, also heavyweight without the best grappling. Like, dude. The thing is, at light heavyweight and heavyweight, the grappling sucks. It's not that good. Okay? And Alex Pereira, just with his Glover to Shara training, is doing just fine to defend the takedowns and the submissions. Or the ground and pound. The only two guys, in my opinion, that could beat him on the ground. The only two guys that can beat him on the ground are John Jones and Tom Aspinall. He'll never fight John Jones because John Jones is petrified of fighting anyone under the age of 41 that's not coming off of a KO loss. Petrified of it. So, I don't even understand the talk about the John Jones fight. No one gives a fuck about John Jones in an imaginary matchup that we know won't happen. All right, We do care about John Jones fighting. Just not in imaginary matchups that won't happen. So let's stop distracting the fan base and the casuals from the fact that John Jones is a duck. He will not fight anyone that's that good. And again, I do feel like a lot of this Alex Burr, John Jones talk, it's unrealistic and it's unfortunate because Tom Aspinall is the one that should be fighting John Jones before Alex Pereira. He should be the one that's getting the title fight next and Alex should fight the winner. And because John Jones isn't going to fight him, and because John Jones won't even fight Alex Pereira, what's the point of even talking about him? He's irrelevant, as far as I'm concerned. He's irrelevant right now. It's only Dana White that's putting his foot down, trying to force him to be relevant, but he's taking himself out of the equation. Alex Pereira and Aspinall is the real championship fight. Aspinall is the legit champion at this point by virtue of John Jones taking himself out of the equation, okay? So it's Pereira versus Aspinall. It's not Pereira versus Jones. It's Pereira versus Aspinall. That's the fight that could be made if Pereira beats Magomed. If Aspinall strikes with him, Pereira's winning. Or maybe not maybe not 100% of the time, like Aspinall could clobber him with the right hand. But again, as I talked about in my breakdown, one big clobbery right hand, one big blitz, a big Shelly, like John Gooden said, that's lower skill than what Alex Pereira is used to seeing coming in his direction. I know Aspinall's fast. I know he's powerful, but like, Dude, Pereira's going to catch Tom Aspinall when his chin is in the air with a left hook. Just like Sergey Pavlovich did. Okay? Sergey Pavlovich caught him, but doesn't have the same left hook, doesn't have the same ability to set it up. I mean, listen, if Aspinall fights with an eagle, and this is the thing, Aspinall, I think that he is one of these guys that will go out there and, and, and trust in his striking to get it done because he's one of the most dangerous fighters on the planet. You know, he has one-punch KO power. He's super fast. He makes most of the heavyweights look plotty. And so, of course, he can strike with a guy like Sergey Pavlovich. But the fact that he did, when he has the grappling, when he knows Sergey Pavlovich doesn't like to grapple, is definitely something that I would worry about when it comes to trusting in Aspinall's chances. Like, I get the idea that Aspinall wants to show that, you know, no one can fuck with him on the feet, and he wants to prove points. If he fights without an ego and he shoots at the legs, he destroys Alex Pereira, in my opinion. But I just don't know if that's realistic. So Alex could knock his ass out. You know what I mean? Narrative shift with Alex, literally um, the biggest narrative shift, honestly, for, for me personally, is that this is actually the first person that, in my mind, I think there are realistic chances of him becoming a triple champion. I've never felt that way about any other fighter. Hamzat Chemaev, I always said pump the brakes. Even when I was a big Hamzat fan, even when I believed in his ability to become one of the best fighters ever, there was still a pump the brakes moment when it came to, can he become a triple champ? Pereira, there's a realistic chance for that. That is massive. But overall, the biggest narrative shift for him is that he's one of the GOATs now. Like, there's really no debate, and he can win a heavyweight title, Okay. Yuri Prohaska, I guess the big narrative shift for him, unfortunately, is that it might be over. But that's dumb. It's dumb. That shouldn't be the narrative shift. It, it, it isn't over. Pereira has different types of power. Okay? He has a different type of power. Different level of skill compared to the most, most of the light heavyweights. And people are saying, Yuri should drop divisions. It's going to be harder to get a title shot. Dude, Pereira's going to be around for one more fight. That's it. Until he moves up to heavyweight. The best defense in heavyweight. I just thought about Yoel Romero saying heavyweight, but 
he's going to have to wait a year and a half, and then there will be a new champion, or there will be a vacant belt. Pereira's not going to be around forever. So, Yuri Prohaska should just continue to do his thing at light heavyweight. It's not over for him. He can improve a little bit with his defense. Um, I guess the other narrative is that, like, this guy didn't improve on his defense. People thought maybe he's going to come and improved. He's not really improving at all, to be honest. Not from what I'm seeing. Uh, maybe just gaining experience points. But, yeah, Yuri's not done. He shouldn't move weight classes into a harder division with a weight cut.